In this market, we uh, construct the consumer and producer surplus uh, model so that we can understand why perfectly competitive markets are, are, are the ideal in economics. There's some, uh, uh, they're said to be efficient. And the, the reason is that the sum of the consumer plus the producer surplus is maximized uh, when markets are perfectly competitive. Okay, consumer and producer surplus are a measure of the welfare that a society realizes from participating in, in, in uh, uh, market economies. Okay, here's the market for compact discs, and let's say that where the price, supply and the demand curve cross, the price is ten dollars. Now, ten dollars is nobody's favorite price. Consumers would rather have a price of zero. Firms would love to have a very, very high price. But $10 is, is uh, desirous, number one, because it's a market clearing price. I'm going to get rid of the supply curve just for a moment so we can discuss consumer surplus. The demand curve shows the willingness uh, and the ability of a consumer to to pay for certain quantities of uh, compact disc in this market. And let's say this first consumer, according to the demand curve, would have been willing and able to pay $30 for a CD. But in fact, the price paid is only $10. So the surplus is $20 worth of benefit not paid for. It's the amount above and beyond the market price uh, of benefit that the consumer realizes. Or it's the, the benefit that the consumer realizes that he or she doesn't have to pay for. The second consumer, let's say, would have been willing and able to pay $28 for a compact disc, but only paid $10. So that person realizes $18 worth of consumer surplus. So the amount of surplus realized by additional units sold is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, in fact, the last unit sold generates no consumer surplus. What the person is willing and able to pay in is $10, and that's what the person pays for the consumer, for the uh, compact disc. So the area above the price and below the demand curve, the area bounded by the orange chalk, uh, and this area would be in units of dollars, is the number of dollars of consumer surplus. The amount of benefit that consumers realized from compact disc above and beyond the $10 per CD they had to pay. Now if the price were to go down to 10, uh, say $9, each of these consumers would get more consumer surplus. The first would now realize 21 units of consumer surplus. And, and in addition, at a lower price, some extra units. So uh, not only would the existing customers get more surplus, but we would uh, capture some more surplus from the extra units that are, are purchased. There's a similar construct for producers. Here's the supply curve, which shows the price that the firms need to receive in order to bring a certain, say the first unit, to bring it to market, the firm needs a dollar. But the firm's going to sell in this market that unit for $10. So the producer realizes some surplus, some payment above and beyond what he or she requires to bring that first unit to market. And in this case, it would be $9 of producer surplus. For the second unit, if that's two, that's the amount that the firm requires in order to bring the product to market and they get $10, that would generate $8 worth of producer surplus. So, by the same logic, the area above the supply curve and below the market price, the area bounded here in green chalk, that is the measure of producer surplus. So, perfect competition, here's what's desirous about perfect competition. When the market is free to set the market price at $10, then the combined areas of consumer surplus plus producer surplus 
these two areas summed together are, are, are the largest area that's possible uh, of any other price that might be imposed on the market. The market clearing price maximizes consumer plus producer surplus. Now let's understand why tampering with the free market causes a reduction in social welfare. Uh, let's consider the market for rental housing in New York City where historically rent control uh, has been a practice. Here's the uh, demand and the supply for the rental housing and let's say that the free market no government intervention that the rental would be a thousand per unit and a hundred would be uh, leased. Okay? The consumer surplus would be this orange area and the producer surplus is the purple area. Now let's impose rent control and we've got to assume that the highest price that uh, uh, can be charged will be something below the equilibrium or market clearing price and let's say it's nine hundred dollars. Now the a number of units that will be rented will be determined by the amount that are supplied because at nine hundred dollars we know that they will be compared to the equilibrium price at a price below that there will be a shortage or an excess demand of units. But the number of units that will actually be available will be determined by the supply curve. And let's say that's 80 units. Okay. Now with this outcome consumer surplus goes from this triangle to this area. I'll identify it with the dashed line. The area changed from this original triangle by number one, fewer units are available. So some people who used to have an apartment now don't have one. So there's a loss of the surplus from those units which previously were rented. But the people who still have an apartment they're paying a lower rent than they would have with no government intervention. So if you will, they saw an increase in their surplus. So the consumer surplus went down by this little area and went up by this area. The people who uh, continue to have an apartment, they're happy with the rent control because their consumer surplus went up. Now producer surplus went from this triangle to the after rent control triangle given by the dashed line, outlined by the dashed line. So producer surplus went down from here to here for a decrease in producer surplus equal to this area. Okay. Now for society, we want to know what happens uh, to the welfare of society when we impose rent control. We need to identify the net effect. Consumers gained this much consumer surplus. Uh, this amount of producer surplus which was lost by the producers. So if you will, this, was just an, this amount was just an exchange of surplus from the producers to the consumers who have the apartments. Okay? But these two areas, which previously were surplus, which are now no longer available because these apartments are not available, uh, we say that there has been a distortion in this market. That means that the number of units available in the market, uh, the number of units uh, rented, has changed from the free market amount of uh, uh, units that would be rented. And that's, that's, that's a distortion to the market. And the loss in of the surplus that was not captured by the consumer 
and this little portion was the loss of consumer surplus, uh, which is no longer realized because of fewer uh, units being uh, rented. This is called the dead weight loss of the rent control. It's the net loss of surplus uh, once we've accounted for this transfer of lost producer surplus that was captured by consumers. So this is the best way to show how the government's intervention in this market, uh, if it's distortionary, causes a loss in uh, net welfare, a net loss in surplus.